say. Genesis 3, 6 to 13. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is God's word, and it's good. You can be seated. Father God, we pray for your blessing upon this time. God, no human words that I have are adequate to explain your truth. However, God, you have so ordained it that through human mouths, your truth can be proclaimed through human minds by your spirit. Your truth can be comprehended. And God, we pray by your grace, by the power of your spirit alone that that would occur today. Communicate your word. Help us understand your word. Change us by your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, Satan has successfully caused Eve. We talked about this last week. He has successfully caused Eve to focus on the forbidden and to desire it. He's caused Eve to question God's goodness And to suspect that God was holding something back from her, something that was for her good. He had successfully caused Eve to question God's sure word of judgment for disobedience. So instead of focusing on all God had blessed her with, instead of focusing on his good character, instead of focusing on the truthfulness of his word, she lingered in the enemy's temptation and she had been deceived. And then this tragic verse of all verses. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Satan had succeeded in his deception in his deception to, see, to get Eve to see the fruit of the forbidden tree differently. This tree that was off limits before the temptation, now she's looking at it a little differently, a lot differently. Instead of seeing this tree from God's view, the judgment for eating from it, she has started to rationalize why it should not be so forbidden. She's rationalizing the perceived benefits of eating from it. The deadly edge of prohibition has been smoothed away in her mind. She is now unfocused and unsatisfied with every other tree, and she is laser focused on her desire for the forbidden tree. She sees its fruit as good for food pleasant to look at, and able to make her wise like God, she thinks, maybe being independent from him, able to 
judge right from wrong from her view instead of his. She wants to be like God. And now all this, what will satisfy her, what is pleasing to her eye, what is, what is going to make her like God, all this now has more sway in her mind than what God had said. She's been tempted by 1 John 2.16, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's nutritional quality. It's good for food. It's nutritional quality. Maybe it's taste. Appeals to the desires of her flesh. She wasn't hungry. Or if she was, she wasn't lacking for food from other trees. There was abundant fruit everywhere. She just wanted the satisfaction that the forbidden fruit offered. Its physical beauty appeals to the desires of her eyes. It's not as if all the other fruit of every other tree was ugly. No, everything that God made was good. But the beauty of the forbidden fruit is all she can see and all she desires at that moment. Its perceived benefit to make her wise like God appeals to her pride. It's not as if she wasn't already blessed by being made in the image of God. No, she wanted to pridefully be like Him in a way that she thought He was unfairly keeping from her. Listen to James 1, 14-15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own Desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So Eve's desire conceives and it births sin in her, which leads to death. We know that they were, they were banished from the garden, banished from the tree of life, and now they would die they died spiritually, sin came in, they were separated from God spiritually, and then they were separated from the garden and the tree of life. They would die physically. And is not what happened to Eve what happens to us when we are tempted? Listen. Instead of focusing when we're tempted, instead of focusing on who God is, that He's good, that abundant blessings are ours in a life of obedience, that His prohibition is for our good, what he, what he keeps us from, what He restricts us from, that's for our good. Think about the, the lines on the road out there, right? There's lines on the road. You're supposed to stay in the lines on the road because if you go in the ditch while you're going 55 miles an hour, you got problems. God's prohibitions are for our good. Abundant blessings are ours in a life of obedience. The effects of disobeying Him are deadly. And instead of focusing on how good He is and all those things, we instead get distracted and we focus on what we are forbidden from. Let's think about the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life for a second. We, we are enamored, thinking of the desires of the flesh, we are enamored by how sin might satisfy our flesh. I'll go ahead and get the big one out of the way. When we think about flesh and satisfaction, we think uh, when it comes to our sexual lives, what will satisfy us sexually and feel good sexually sometimes causes us to sin sexually. but also things that taste good, physically taste good, sometimes cause us to sin in our gluttonous efforts to appease our taste buds, our hunger. I think about the desires of the flesh that cause us to want revenge and to put somebody in their place because it makes us feel like we told them. satisfying sometimes when we get that word out and we put someone in their place or we type that post or we use that passive aggressive comment to say something that's unwise and ungodly things that comfort us and that 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 
that appeal to our sense of comfort and ease and relaxation and all that, sin comes in through our comfort needing to be satisfied. Or money. I mean, money is that, right? Money is, money will satisfy me, right? What money can get me will satisfy me, right? So we will do all we can do to get what money we need and justify so much sin, even a love of money, to satisfy our flesh. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes. Are we not tempted by the desires of our eyes? Pornography is the, the secret, hidden, hush-hush sin that runs rampant through our culture. And all around the world, even in the church, the desires of the eyes through the TV screen or the phone screen lure us into sin. We see someone or something that, that is beautiful to us and we go after it and we justify sin to go get it. This is totally shifting gears, but my wife and I were, were understanding the, the, um, the lack of benefit, the consequences of dyes in your food and, and how... And how dyes cause our, our kids behavioral issues. So we're thinking about these food dyes and trying to stay away from food dyes. And it just makes me think, why in the world do we, as a culture, use food dyes that are so unhealthy and so unhelpful? Why do other countries ban them? You know why? Because if it's pleasing to our eye, we will buy it. We buy junk food. Because it appeals to the desires of our flesh, but also because it appeals to the desires of our eyes. This peppermint in my pocket, which I'm going to, after the uh, message today, after the service today, I'm going to eat this for your benefit. <laughs> but, but if this was black, it would look to me like licorice, and I probably wouldn't want to eat it as much as that nice red and white combination that makes me look like, feel like Christmas time. You know, uh, things, things that appeal to our eyes make us want it, and sin appeals to us visually, and we go get it. That'll look good on me. That'll, that, that'll make me look good in front of others. I'm going to do what I can to get And we make unwise, sinful decisions because of the desires of our eyes. I think about the pride of life. We want to be like God. We want to make our own decisions. We don't want somebody telling us what's right and wrong. We want to be the one who judges what's right and wrong. It appeals to our pride. I was Daniel's brother posted something on Facebook. I think it was yesterday. Maybe you've seen it running around. It's 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 a picture of a of a of a pie, and it's cut, you know, in like a pie is supposed to be cut, right, into six pieces. You know, like like a pizza or something, and but in the middle of that, you know, uh, the lines that are that are cutting it into equal pieces, like right in the middle is a triangle, just in an awkward way, like right in the middle. It's not even touching any of the crust. It's just not cut in the way that it's supposed to be cut. And the heading is because no one tells me what to do, and that's the way we think. We don't want somebody to tell us what to do. We want to tell us what to do. We want to make what we do right and what we deem right to be right. We want to be the judge of what's right and wrong. We want to be like God in that way. And so we sin. Instead of godly desires, we are lured by sinful desires. And if we don't flee from them, Sin will be conceived and birth in us, and it will lead to our destruction. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. I've already alluded to some of it. Listen, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. 
So Eve saw that fruit, but she should have fled from it. May we stop, church. May we stop looking longingly at that which will tempt us to sin. So how did all this go down? Where was Adam in all this? It's a good question. People have different ideas about this. Was Adam with her when she was with the serpent being deceived? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. The plural in in verses 1 through 5, you is plural. And it may indicate that he was. But we do know, according to 1 Timothy 2.14, that Adam was not deceived by the serpent. So if he was there, he wasn't deceived by the serpent. But what we do know is that when she took of that fruit, he was there. So when the, the, temp, the interaction with the serpent happened and when the taking of the fruit happened and how much time was in that, between there, whether it was seconds or minutes or hours or days, I don't know. But when, he, when she was there... Taken from the, the, the tree, the forbidden fruit, he was there. It says, who was with her? This is instructive to us, all this. Listen, one. Instead of consulting Adam as the leader of their marriage, in such a monumental moment as disobeying her creator and disobeying her husband, she subverted her authority, the authority given to her, and she made the huge decision to eat. By coming to Eve, Satan opposed God's leadership structure, and Eve fell for it. it. Satan opposes God's design, and he uses us to subvert it. When tempted, we focus on what we want instead of using good wisdom and following God's design that would keep us from sin. Oh, Eve didn't want to go talk to Adam about this. Eve didn't want to consult him. She wanted what she wanted. She didn't use good wisdom. She used selfish desire. Two, Adam was with his wife, and he let her eat from that forbidden tree. Adam bailed on his spiritual leadership over his wife. God came to Adam, verse 9, we'll see. God came to Adam asking where he was. Did God know they ate from the fruit of the tree? Sure he did. Did he know where they were? Of course he did. Did he know Eve ate first? God knows all things. But he came looking for Adam. This indicates Adam's leadership and his responsibility for what had happened. Husbands, listen, we, uh, my question to us as husbands are, is this, Are we leading our wives and our families in the ways of the Lord, praying for their protection, praying for their holiness, wanting to keep them from sin and pursuing holiness? Or are we so distracted by our life, our sinful pursuits, our desires for what we want, following the desires of our flesh and and the desires of our eyes and the pride of our life, and all the while leading our family into that? Are we so distracted by our life and our sinful pursuits that we are abdicating our leadership, and letting those under our leadership eat of forbidden fruit? Are we just so distracted of living our lives and doing our things that all those given under our spiritual care and our leadership are just eating of forbidden fruit all day long and we don't even know it because we're so distracted? Do we even see this as a big deal? Are we hesitant in our marriages to show spiritual leadership, husband? Is it the path of least resistance to just give in and not lead? Oh, husbands, we've got to repent. Number three, Eve sinned, and she influenced Adam to sin. Our sinful actions can lead others into sin as well. We can be deceived thinking sin is okay, and by doing so, we lead other people into sin. So how vital is it for us to stay close to the Word of God, not be deceived that we not fall and lead others to as well? 
we could be following a certain way of thought. And a, a, lot of us, a lot of us live by how we grew up. And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of things we believe doctrinally and spiritually are based on tradition and what we heard from so-and-so that was above us, and it's not based on the Word of God. I, 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 I told you a couple weeks ago or whenever that I'm kind of big on Little House on the Prairie right now. And I'm watching Little House on the Prairie, and I'm like, wait a minute. It, there's a very spiritual flavor to a lot of what Little House on the Prairie is, but a lot of it is way, way off. It's based on American tradition and religious thought and all that, but it is not biblical. And I look at it, and I'm like, my goodness, that is the way the group think of religious think thinks in this country. A lot of us are, 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 are leading others into sin because we're not following the Bible. We're following what grandma taught us or what American Christianity, quote unquote, teaches us. And we're leading people into sin. Some of us are following false teachers and we're leading people into sin. Some of us think that certain things are okay because we just think it's okay, but it's against the Bible and we're leading those that we influence into sin. Number four before we move to verse 7. Adam was not deceived by the serpent. Again, 1 Timothy 2 tells us that. So when Adam ate, it wasn't because he was deceived, it was blatant disobedience. It was defiant, conscious rebellion in the midst of so much goodness, so much blessing, so much beauty, so much knowledge, so much joy. So God, spare us from conscious, defiant rebellion and a desire to have what we want and do what we want. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. If you go back up to chapter 2, verse 25, before sin entered, before they sinned, this is the description of man and woman. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. But verse 7 of chapter 3 then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Before the fall, before they sinned, there was innocence. There was no guilt. There was no sin. There was no shame. There was no self-consciousness. There was no shame in their nakedness. There were no barriers to relational intimacy. Ligonier Ministries says this, quote, In Eden... This was pre-fall. In Eden, the goals for marriage could be easily achieved because there was no danger of one spouse shaming the other in any way. End quote. But after they sinned, their eyes were opened. And they saw themselves differently. They had knowledge of sin and evil in them now. And it brought an awareness of their nakedness. Instead of elevating them as Satan promised, they were dragged down to shame and guilt. Their self-consciousness brought them shame in their nakedness such that they covered their sexual organs with fig leaves to cover the shame that came from their sin. So what's the connection here? I don't know fully. I've got a couple options maybe. Were their sexual thoughts now corrupted that, that they felt a need to hide their bodies in shame? Or did they no longer feel innocent vulnerability between one another because of selfishness and sin and the accusing sinful eyes of the other? Did they feel guilty before God, which caused them to see themselves and their bodies differently and in shame now? Whatever it is, the fall perverted their view of their nakedness. And it is seen as shameful now. The word naked and in chapter 2, verse 25, and the word crafty in, in three, chapter 3, verse 1, speaking of Satan, those two words are very, very similar. And it's likely an intended word play. 
naked and crafty, the original words sound very much alike and look very much alike. So there's probably a word play going on here. The serpent's craftiness led to the shame of their nakedness. What was not shameful in their innocence is now shameful in their guilt. So instead of running to God in open confession of their sin, what do they do? They feebly try to cover their shame that came from sin with fig leaves, and and then they try to hide from Him. Don't we do that? When we sin, don't we try to cover the shame of our sin with justification for it? Oh, it's okay. I sinned, uh, but it's okay, and here's why. And we try to cover our sin with justification for it, sometimes even in brazen pride. Don't we try to hide our sin from others? Don't we try to hide our sin vainly from God? Don't so many people try to cover their bad by doing good in a human fig leaf effort to cover their sin and make themselves acceptable to God? I can't, y'all going, it's Huey Lewis again, y'all. Look, I'm, 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 I'm doing a tiny bit of work yesterday around the house, and I like I listen to some Huey Lewis while I do it. And their song "Jacob's Ladder" comes on, and I'm not gonna really totally get into it. But the whole premise of the song is Jacob's ladder is that you can see it in the Old Testament. There's there's a vision of a ladder going up to heaven and angels descending down, and Jesus even refers to it, I think, in in the New Testament. But but the whole idea Huey Lewis is talking about is this: he meets he meets this religious guy on the street who comes up to give him salvation, and he says, no, I'm doing all right, the best that I can. And then he sees a televangelist or somebody on TV who's probably a wacky guy anyway, and, he, and, and, and he, he's saying, give me money and all this kind of stuff. And Huey's like, I don't want to be like you. I'm just trying to make tomorrow better than today. Rung by rung, climbing up the ladder to God. That's what people do. They see their sin and they're like, well, if I can just cover my bad with good and just make tomorrow better and just try to cover up all the bad things I do with a bunch of good things, maybe at the end of my life, God will weigh the good as as, as weightier than the bad and he'll let me in. And we try to cover our sin with our good works, our fig leaf efforts, and it doesn't cover us. Only the righteousness of Christ can cover us. Listen, Adam hid from God. They, they put fig leaves on, and then they hid from God when they saw, heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They were covered, but they still felt shame and hid. It didn't work. Their covering didn't work. They were still fearful in their nakedness. Fig leaves didn't adequately cover their shame, their fear, and their guilt. Nothing can cover our sin and our shame completely. Nothing except Jesus. Scripture says that God loved us and sent, 1 John 4, 10, God loved us and sent Christ to be the propitiation for our sins. On the cross of of Christ, while while Christ was dying on the cross, he was was taking our sin, all our sin that brought us so much shame and guilt before God and, and, and worthiness to be judged and condemned forever. Christ was taking that upon himself and God was pouring his wrath and judgment and punishment for our sin upon Christ. And Jesus fully atoned for our sin. The price was paid. He was raised from the dead. And in Jesus' resurrection, we see victory over sin and death. That we can look to a Savior now who has fully paid for our sin. And when we put our faith and trust in Christ as our Savior, it's my favorite verse, you've heard me say it so many times, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, that's Jesus, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He's bearing our sin on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? So that in him we can become the righteousness of God. So now when we come to Christ, when we say, God, I am a sinner, I am shameful, I'm not hiding from you, I'm not trying to cover up my sin from you, I'm I'm open and laid bare, a sinner unworthy, I can't climb Jacob's ladder to get to you, I can't make it rung by rung to you. I am dead in my sin. 
my wickedness, my evil, my wretchedness, my depravity. God, I need you. I need what Jesus did. I need his atoning sacrifice for my sin. And so, God, I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning from my efforts to please you on my own and achieve some type of right standing with you. I, I'm, I'm turning from that, and I'm trusting in what Christ did. And the Bible says when we do that, he forgives all our sin, and he covers us in the righteousness of Christ. We are clothed. We are covered not in a fig leaf of our own effort, but in the righteousness of Christ and the work that he did on the cross. We're covered in his righteousness and, and before God, because we're covered in the righteousness of Christ, we are accepted, freely, forgiven, free, justified, right with God. There's only one name under heaven given by which man may be saved, and that's Jesus. So let's stop covering our sin. Let's, let's stop trying to hide our sin from God. Let's confess our sin. Let's repent. Let's let Jesus cover our sin. See, this is going to not sit well with some of you, but it's the truth. It was right for Adam and Eve to feel shame. It was right. They should have felt shame. In this, in this culture where we're trying to make people feel less shameful, less guilty, we're working against God. We're working against the gospel. It was right for Adam and Eve to feel shame. They had betrayed and disobeyed their creator. We want so bad for people to feel so good about themselves and all this kind of stuff that we are betraying God and his holiness in our effort to be compassionate to others. In our compassion for sinners, we must not minimize their sense of guilt and shame. Sin is an offense to the holy God who created us for his glory. For his sake, we should call sin what it is and defend his holiness in others' lives, in our life. We in our sin have offended God. We're guilty. We, they, we should feel conviction and guilt and shame. We should be honest about that but also be honest about the tremendous grace that Christ offers, that God offers in Christ. Only when we see our horrible shame and our sin can we know the need of salvation and appreciate the bountiful grace in Christ to cover our guilt and shame. All that shame and guilt that just weighs us down and we should feel because we have offended God is released when we trust in Christ. Be honest about our guilt and shame, but be honest about the grace offered in Christ. Amen? Verses 8 to 10. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and, the man and, his, uh, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This was God, many say, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the wind of the day, the, the breezy time of the day, the, maybe the evening time of the day. But God's walking in the garden. And this suggests the close fellowship that the first couple had with God. Before the fall. Yet fearful of his presence because of their nakedness and their shame and their guilt, they hid from him. Fellowship is interrupted. Sin interrupts fellowship with God. What should have been a joyful time was now a fearful time of separation. Kenneth Matthews says this, quote, They are pictured in the narrative like children hiding in fearful shame from their father. End quote. But they couldn't hide from God. Sinners cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. He sees our wickedness. God's question to Adam, where are you? It didn't indicate that God didn't know where he was. Of course he did. God knows all. He knows where they were. 
His question was more to get Adam to see where he, Adam, was. Where are you, Adam? Mm, I'm hiding in the trees because of my sin and my guilt and my shame. He wanted Adam to see where he was. God wanted Adam to see himself in his lost condition. Matthew Henry says this, quote, Those who by sin have gone astray from God should seriously consider where they are. They are afar off from all good in the midst of their enemies in bondage to Satan and in the high road to utter ruin. End quote. Oh, God could have incinerated them. Fire from heaven on the spot, and it would have been just. It would have been right. But he didn't. That's grace. He came to them with a gracious question to let them see their sinful condition. That is grace. Was he giving them a chance to repent? I think so. That's grace. Only when we see our lost condition can we see our need for forgiveness and mercy. God showing us our lostness, our guilt, and our shame is grace. Look at this. They sinned, but did they seek after God? No. They hid from God. He sought them. That is grace. Romans 3.11 says nobody seeks after God. He seeks after us. If you're saved, it's not because you sought God. It's not because you were like, I think I'm just going to get right today with God. No, it's because he sought you. If you respond to God, it's because he sought you first. That's amazing grace. And we'll get there next week, but after the couple's sin, God promised one who would bring salvation from sin, Genesis 3.15. That is grace. This whole interaction is a display of God's grace. So Adam and Eve were right to feel guilt and shame for their sin. Guilty sinners should feel a sense of fear in the presence of the holy God who has a just right to judge them. So while that is healthy and while that is good, we must also see His tremendous grace offered to us in our sin and from our sin. He is justly wrathful against sin. And in Christ, He approaches us with forgiving grace for those who rightly see their guilt feel their shame, and receive His grace. So it's when we have an imbalanced view of God that we misrepresent Him and do spiritual harm to ourselves and others. It's when, it's when we say, God is all wrathful. Hellfire and brimstone all the time. We misrepresent God. Oh, He is wrathful, and He will judge sin, and many will go to hell because of their sin, because they rejected His grace in Christ. But He's also loving kind and compassionate. And in the midst of our deserving wrath, He graciously gives grace. And when we have a balanced view of that to the world, we offer a right view of God. A lot of people don't, they don't want to focus on this because there's so much bad news and they don't like confrontation. They want people to feel good about themselves, but they're active, when, they, when we deny this, we actively work against this. Because you don't know grace until you know how deep in sin you are. Let's do 11 through 13 really quickly and we'll be done. God said, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Oh, church, hear this. God knew that their shame came from disobedience. They ate from the tree. He knew that. And he asked Adam if he ate from the tree that he commanded them not to eat from. Now look what Adam does. Before admitting that he ate, Adam shifts blame to his wife. She gave it to me. Oh, and by the way, God, you gave her to me. And he indirectly blames God for his sin. He was supposed to lead his wife, but she was led by him into sin. 
And then when God asked Eve about it, before she admits that she ate, she shifts blame to the serpent. He deceived me, and I ate. They were to have dominion over creation, but she was led into sin by the created serpent. The serpent led her. God's design is upside down. When God confronted them in such grace after their sin, giving them the opportunity to throw themselves on his mercy and seek his forgiveness, they seemed to try to alleviate their culpability by blaming someone else. Sin is in them now, and they sinfully hide and make excuses for their sin because that's what sinners do. We hate to admit our guilt so much. We'll find any way to excuse it. Look what Adam did. He made himself a victim of his circumstances. And worse, a victim of God's doing. People shift blame for their sin like this all the time. Oh my goodness, let me just mention a few. We could talk for days. Did you see the way I grew up? Did you see my parents? You know what they did to me? And we justify our sin. And we shift blame from, I just committed this sin and rebellion against God to, well, this is why I did it. And so that makes that okay, right? Do you know what the church is? The church is full of hypocrites. People who just, they don't get it. And people go live in sin all day long and try to blame the church for it. When they get to heaven, but God, your church didn't reach out to me. Your church didn't love me. Your church didn't make me feel good about who I was and what I was doing. Your church, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Is the church perfect? Absolutely not. But one day we're all going to stand before God with no excuses. Oh, but God made me that way. He made me that way. I was just born like this. Blame shifting. Look, I'm not going to get in an argument with you about your genetics and how all that plays with lifestyles and pre, you know, uh, 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 tendencies and all that kind of stuff. We are all born in sin conceived in sin. We are all prone to disobey God. So whatever you want to have that argument, I'm telling you, sin is sin. And if you want to say you were born that way, fine. Jesus wants to give you rebirth. Oh, but my spouse, you don't know my spouse. You don't know him or her. Your sin's still on you. This government is corrupt. I can, and we justify our sin because we have corrupt leaders. So much more. You know, we We blame shift all the time. We make ourselves victims. In an effort to mute the horror of our disobedience, we blame shift and we cast in us an accusing aspersion on God who's sovereign over all things. Look, God gave you your wife. God sets up leaders. God is in control of all these situations. And when you use all these things, and he's using them for his purpose, and when you use all these things to justify your sin, you're really blaming God for your sin. Or we say things like this, God wouldn't have given me this if you didn't want me to do this. And we justify our sin and blame God for it. We make excuses. When you truly love God, no excuse is worthy enough to disobey Him. Just as being burned at the stake wasn't a worthy enough threat to cause the martyrs to deny Him. Adam's sin was his own. Eve's sin was her own. Our sin is our own. Eve blamed the serpent's deception. Are we tempted? Of course we're tempted, but our sin is on us. The reality is we want, to, we want the pleasures of sin and disobedience without the responsibility for it, so we blame shift. We make ourselves a victim, and we make excuses. But notice, God still cursed them for their sin. He didn't say, oh, I get it. Yeah, that's silly. That's silly snake. I get it, Eve. I cut you some slack. No, he cursed her. And the very excuse that Adam gave for the reason he sinned, the woman you gave to be with me, and we'll see next week, God says, 
because you listen to your wife. I'm cursing you. They were guilty. Our excuses for sin are so absolutely inadequate. We are guilty. We must not hide our sin. We must not try to cover up our sin. We must not make excuses for our sin or blame others for our sin. We must own our sin, confess it fully and humbly, and plead for God's grace and mercy in Christ. I want to close with Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Because of this account that we saw today, sin came into humanity. He became a sinner, Adam did, Eve did, and all who come from them are sinful. That's you and me. But unlike Adam and Eve, we don't have the ability to always choose the good. They did, but they didn't. We don't have the ability to choose the good. Now we are corrupted. We can't not sin. We by nature will choose sin, which leads to death. We're totally depraved. Death came, and it spread to all of us. But, look at verses 15 and 19. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, The many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Look, Adam sinned and brought death to us all. Brought sin and death to us all. But Jesus came and through his one act, when we look at his life of obedience and his obedient, giving himself over to God's will to die on the cross for our sin, through through, through his work through his act we who are sinful and worthy of shame can be made righteous and justified before God that is grace in the middle of a horrible Genesis 3 account look to Jesus look to Jesus he's the only hope out of the destruction of death that comes because of sin amen oh God what what rich truth what Fantastic, gracious news that we have in Christ. Oh God, help us see ourselves. Oh God, help us see how we are tempted. Help us see how we justify. Help us see how we make excuses. God, give us eyes to see our sin. To flee it. God, when we find ourselves falling into it, may we get out of the trees, leave the fig leaves in a drawer, and come humbly, open, vulnerable to Christ, relying only in your grace through Him for our forgiveness, our restoration to you, and the righteousness that you want to make us into, that we can rely on the power of God and the indwelling Spirit to help us flee from sin, see it what it is, and to live righteous lives that that reflect more and more each day 
the righteous standing we have before you in Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, amen.